You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jane Lewin Yang. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Before We Ever Spoke by Dan Largent Cleveland, Ohio, 2006. After a chance encounter, three people soon find out that life can sometimes thrust us into the public eye even when taking great measures to avoid it. Cooper Madison was the best pitcher in baseball after being drafted number one overall in 1996 from the small Gulf Coast town of Pass Christiane, Mississippi. One year after announcing his sudden and shocking retirement, he finds himself seeking anonymity in Cleveland, Ohio. Kara Knox is the youngest sibling to three older brothers. After a tragic work accident to her closest relative, she has built up a tough exterior as she begins her final year of college at Cleveland State University. Jason Knox, Kara's oldest brother, is the lead detective on Cleveland's Edgewater Park Killer case. After months without a suspect, he's feeling the heat from his media-hungry chief. Serendipity intervenes, and all three learn that perception and reality are paths that rarely ever intersect. Before We Ever Spoke by Dan Largent Hey, folks, you really ought to check out Patricia Gillum's Heroes of Corvus uh, series. Uh, Book one is called A Superhero's Duty, a fight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the death of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night and Cameron and the rest of the city are not out of danger. A Superhero's Duty, book one of the Heroes of Corvus by Patricia Gillum. Get this series now. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Irene Kessler on the phone with me today. She's uh, calling in to talk about her new book, Mountain of Full Moons. And when you're hearing this, uh, I believe it's release day for the book. So uh, congratulations on the on the release, Irene, and welcome to the show. 
Well, thank you so much. It's really exciting. <laughs> I, well, I am excited to talk with you. I love the book. It's fantastic. And I think a lot of people are really going to uh, find that the story resonates with them. I hope so. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, Irene, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, <laughs> well, actually, I never wanted to be a writer. You see, in third grade, my teacher told me that my writing was terrible. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, yes. And um, <laughs> and. Not only was it terrible, but I mean, she went on and on and on. And, and but I told her, I said, well, I don't want to be a writer anyway. I want to sing. And that was the first thing that I did. But eventually, of course, uh, I loved books. When I was eight, we moved to a, a new place in, in the Bronx, New York. And the library was only one block away. And I was alone. I didn't have any friends. You know, I had just gotten there. And the library became my sanctuary. And I would go and, and grab, I don't know, armfuls and armfuls of books and bring them home and read them and then bring them back and get the next <laughs> armful. And it was it's funny, but, you know, sometimes you don't connect things until many, many years later, sometimes during the writing of the, the, yeah, the writing of the book, that I realized that when I did that at age seven or eight, um, I took out books on European history. I was reading about kings and queens. And, and I realized, oh my goodness, of course I wrote historical fiction. Why wouldn't I? <laughs> right. You know, but, but it never occurred to me until that moment that, uh, you know, that that's what started this whole thing, this, this little bitty thing way, way back when, you know, followed me through my whole life and didn't even talk to me, but somehow I knew historical fiction was where I had to be. Oh, that, <laughs> that's, that's so amazing. Um, do you, can you put your finger on on what it was about historical fiction that that uh, uh, you know connected with you so strongly? Well, I think I think I just loved the stories about the kings and queens, and that the queens um, had some power, at least a little bit of power. But the other books that I read were all about mythology and the powerful women of mythology, like Diana with her 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 sword or what it, and, and, and I realized too, that that was a very big thing for me because what I saw in my own life and in those around me was that it, when I was young, women had no power. You, you stayed home and you cooked and you took care of the kids and you cleaned the house and the man went to work, brought home the money, which was the important stuff. And, um, you know, you, you didn't have a chance to really speak your mind. And I think that's what my whole thing is about. Hope, hoping to help people to speak up, women to speak up. Right. Um, Irina, you, you alluded to, um, you know, this, this thing that, um, that you said you didn't even know that it was speaking to you. Um, until it did, uh, a lot of us have this uh, story where we we have dreams of being a writer, telling our own stories, things like that. And then life gets in the way and and we begin, you know, families and careers and things like that. And until the that thing starts tugging at us again. And for some people that's in their 20s and for some people that's in their 30s and some people that's in their 40s and, you know, the different stages of life bring opportunity and uh and and things like that but your story is a it is a similar story to all those but a little bit different um you you were 80 when you uh first decided to to tell your story is that right well not well let me go back a little bit Please. i was in my 70s okay and i had a i have a friend named sonia who is a writer 
And I never thought anything about it because we were both, she was also a singer. We were also singing all over the place at that time. But um, I guess it was a couple of years later that she, I spoke to her and she said, oh, I'm writing this book about whatever it was. And oh, and I just finished this book and I just did a whole thing on po- with poetry on 9-11. And I looked at her and I said, oh, you know, maybe that's something I could do too. It hadn't really occurred to me until my best friend said, well, she writes, you know, and actually I knew it before, but somehow I heard it differently. And um, so I decided to write. I found a critique group, uh, but I was going to write my memoir, not knowing, of course, that it's one of the more difficult things to write. (laughs) And I would come into my critique group and read, and they would all go, oh, she's doing it again. She's whining. She's whining. And I didn't know what they meant. I thought I was telling it out straight, but I wasn't. And so finally, after being with them for a couple of years, I just stopped and put that away. And and then I went on to write this book. When when you were writing uh, memoir, uh, was there was there a particular uh, time period in your life that that kept coming up to you, and um, could could you put your finger on on exactly what it was you were you were trying to get out? Well, I'm writing my memoir now. <laughs> And I think it's the same thing that it was then. It's all about speaking up for women to be able to speak their minds, for women to have a place in society that counts, that they want, that they that they deserve. Um, for me, that's that's been a lot of what my whole life has been about. Uh, because I grew up at a time when none of that happened. And even today, I mean, even today, if you look at it, yes, women are doing better, but we're still not all as equal as men. And women are, are the ones who get hurt by men. And that hasn't stopped either. I don't know how, how this society is ever going to make it stop. But it, that has always been the essence of of what I talk about. I mean, even with the Alicia book, there's right. some of that in there too. Well, well speaking of the Alicia book, uh, the the new book is called Mountain of Full Moons. Um, it, did did telling this this fictional um, this historical fiction story help to uh, to codify uh, the the feelings that you were wanting to express but but give you an avenue since this is a a a a, a, fic, a fictional character um you know there's not quite the the baggage if you will that that comes you know you're telling her story and it's um you know it doesn't have to be you it doesn't have to be someone you know um is it is it freeing to tell um to work out some of these things in a fictional character Absolutely. At least it was for me. I mean, I just sat down and wrote. The words came into my head and I put them down on the the fake paper <laughs> computer, you know, and, and they just came to me and I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. Um, and it wasn't until I almost finished writing and started to edit some of the stuff that I realized Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm right back where I was. It's the same thing. Yes, absolutely. It, I think it freed, it freed me up and taught me enough that now I can write that novel that I first want. I'm, that, I'm sorry, that, write, that memoir that I first wanted to write. Absolutely. Absolutely. With, without a question of a doubt. So, so tell us about this character, um, Alicia. We've we've alluded to her um, a little bit, and this really intriguing setting um, that uh, that the book takes place in. Um, she 
uh, Alicia is this great character and you have her encounter some some characters of epic proportions. Um, tell me about how the story came about and why you chose to set it where and when you did. <laughs> Again, the setting just came to me and I went with it. I never even thought about the why or wherefore. Um, and I just went with the times. I had been to Jerusalem um, years ago and saw some of it. So I felt comfortable with placing it there, but I didn't place it there on, perfect, uh, on purpose. I mean, it just... It just happened. Um, so I'm sorry. Now, what was the rest of your question? I, I was asking why you chose to set it uh, where and when you did. And, uh, you know, um, tell me about uh, incorporating some of the characters that, that she meets. Oh, well, um, some of the characters. Well, I think I think the, the big characters that she meets are, of course, uh, Sarah and Abraham. Yes, that that's that's what I was I, trying to to prompt you there to to talk about them because they're so fun in this book. Oh yes, they're wonderful, wonderful people, and I'm sure that they were, you know, back then in those years, and and they they wanted to help, and they wanted to teach, and one of the things Alicia wanted so badly was to learn for someone to teach her the things that she needed to know, that she wanted to know. And so um, in the story, first she goes to, um, to, Eru to Jerusalem, I call it Jerusalem in the book, and um, the, uh, her guardian angel gets her to Abraham. And she stays in class with Abraham where there is a mixture of men and women. Uh, and she learns from Abraham and the, the, uh, a man's way of thinking and how a man says things. And she learns about the world and the world Abraham has about him, with the way he wants to live, the way he wants other people to live, how he is teaching other people what is the best way to live. And then eventually... She moves on because they leave for Curious Arbo, which is where they live, and they take her with them. And then she, she stays with Sarah, and Sarah teaches her from the feminine point of view, from the being kind and compassionate and, um, and willing to help and, and how to work with women and so she gets both the the masculine and the feminine sides of of learning and that's what pushes her to move on to write songs with Abraham's words and Sarah's wisdom which of course the jet she then takes out into the land of Canaan and sings how long did it take you to write this book Irene about three years, I think. It was essentially a first book. <laughs> I can't ca count the other one. So I think it took me about three, maybe three and a half, four years. I'm not quite sure. Gotcha. D did you know from the beginning um, uh, where this story was going to end? Nope, I did not. That, that's I didn't... part of the fun, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, it is part of the fun because, I mean, you know, there's a twist at the end that even I never <laughs> expected to have happen. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no. I, I love when, when those kind of uh, surprises happen in the writing and, and the story uh, mm -hmm. kind of takes on a life of its own. Uh, that's that's so much fun as a writer. It is. It is. It is. I mean, all through the book, as I said, most of the time, um, I just sat and wrote. I didn't even know what I was writing. I mean, I was just writing the words that came into my head. I had to read it later to really look at it and be begin to understand what I was writing about. It was only, I think, in the rewrites that really caught, 
you know, the, the essence of what was happening in the book. And then I was able to, of course, make it even better. Uh, but, I, you know, otherwise, I, I just, I, it, it was a, I found it a very, a weird situation, but a <laughs> wonderful situation that the words just came and I just threw them on the page. Oh, that's the best. Uh, did, did you find yourself at, at the end of that first draft with, uh, uh, was it, I mean, could you, could you see the cohesive story in that or did, did it take another pass through the things you had written to kind of find the narrative thread and to, to piece it together? No, the cohesiveness was already there. Oh, that's wonderful. Was already there. I had to work on it sure. to make it even clearer. <laughs> and um, but no, the the cohesiveness was actually there. I mean, I was shocked when I when I realized that that I really had this thing. I had the themes. I had all of this stuff going that needs to be, you know, that is part of the craft that you need. Um, with, without even knowing it was happening. Wow. Did, did I hear um, that there's a, a story about your granddaughter um, that, that might have prompted the writing of this book? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. <laughs> and again, it's a little weird, but... <laughs> I, I, will, I love weird stories. I will happy to, be happy to tell it to you. Okay. I live in Florida, and Florida has torrential rains during the summer mm -hmm. and I used to leave Florida for a couple of months because those rains gave me very bad headaches so I took myself up to Peekskill New York and found a place to stay for the two months um, I had been there as a child my folks had a bungalow up there so it was very familiar to me and and it felt really good to be in that in that I don't know, I guess because I knew it, it just felt good to be there. So my granddaughter lived in um, Connecticut, not too far away. So she came <laughs> to, oh, you know, a, a couple of days with me. And, um, you know, we went out and I bought her some clothes and I bought her some makeup and we schmoozed around and <laughs> and we had dinner and so on and so forth. And we just had a wonderful, wonderful time. But the next morning when I woke up, I realized that she was sleeping in the room where the computer was and I couldn't get to my computer. I didn't want to wake her up. So... I went into the kitchen and I made my cup of tea and I came back and I sneaked into the room and I got a yellow pad and a pen and went back into my room and got into bed. And I sat down, I, I sat in bed and then that's when all the words came. I had about four pages of writing. And when I when I, when I finished all the writing, I got up out of bed and I took this piece of paper and I looked at it and I decided to read it out loud, which is something that I usually do as part of my craft. And I read it and then I was really, really confused. So I looked up at the ceiling like I was looking at heaven and I said, hey, you gave me all these words. <laughs> Every sentence starts with she. What's her name? And they said, Alicia. And that's how she was born. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, in, in, the, uh, in, in the book, Alicia um, talks to angels. And, uh, you know, she, she, uh, she gets a lot of uh, sideways glances, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, but d do you feel like that, that you had uh, uh, someone dictating to you? Um, well, yes, I guess I <laughs> so. Um, y you know, I mean, I went, I went my own way after I was an adult, and I got a, into a lot of spirituality. Uh, and my father and mother, you know, poo-poo the whole thing. It's like, oh, please, come on. They, they became atheists after, you know, and, and they told me this. They became atheists after 
uh, the Holocaust. And I think many Jewish people did because they just felt that where was God in all of this and, and how did God allow it to happen? But of course, through spirituality, you learn why these things happen and and why God makes them happen. And, and at any rate, I got into a lot of spirituality. Um, and my, as I said, my parents were very much against it, but... I just went with it because it was right for me. And uh, and, and this this beautiful story came out of that. I mean, you there's uh, you know, and and connecting with Abraham and Sarah, um, you know, the the uh, the you know the roots of of, of your faith um, is that's a fun. Uh, time period and and uh, to explore and uh, yeah uh, when when you first started sharing the story with people what what was their reaction? They really liked it. They really did, and I <laughs> I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked because I didn't expect to uh, to hear the the words that I heard, and uh, and even now um, I have some wonderful, wonderful women who have read the book as readers and, uh, you know, they sent me their reviews and I'll tell you, I was blown away. I was blown away, not because, not just because they love the book, but because they picked up on every nuance that was in the book. And that amazed me because I kept saying, are people going to get what I'm trying to say here? You know, I, that that thing that goes through your head that says, hmm, did you really do a good job? Uh, you know, and sure enough, these reviews were just absolutely fabulous. There's nothing better uh, than than when someone gets, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when, when a story clicks with them. And, uh, and there's almost an, an unspoken thing that goes between the author and the reader through the book which is an amazing thing right right exactly and and i had non-jewish people read the book i did not pick out you know jewish people just because i'm jewish i had uh, many non-jewish women read the book and they had the same reaction right well it's a timeless story that it, uh yes thank you i, I thought that but i <laughs> i wasn't yeah. well, it's a, it's an amazing book, Mountain of Full Moons. Um, today is release day when you're listening to this, and it's available uh, on Amazon for sure. There's a link to it in the show notes, and when your favorite bookstore uh, opens back up, be sure to check there uh, for it as well. There's links to it in the show notes of this episode. Um, mm -hmm. Irene, I love the book, and we're recommending it to everyone. Um, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for allowing me to, and thank you for the fun we've had. 